Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Flora Church right here in beautiful downtown Flora, Mississippi. I'm glad you're with us today. It's February the 4th, the year of our Lord, 2024. It's going to be a long year. It's leap year, isn't it? So we get one extra day. How about that? So uh, we're going to have a wonderful February, whether we have a 29th or not. Next Sunday, uh, next Saturday at 10 a.m., make sure you have your chili, your crock pot of chili prepared and bring it right here to the church to be judged. And then uh, after we judge the, the, the chili, we will go uh, immediately into lunch and we will serve the bowls of chili. It's a bottomless bowl. Come and eat all you wish. And uh, I don't remember what the donation is. You make a donation and all of that money. We used to call this Chili for Chili. We were doing missions in Chile. We still do missions in Chile, but Cuba takes most of our time and most of our energy. And so we dedicated this Chili Cook-Off in, uh, I guess, the last 10 or so to our fundraising in, in uh, Cuba. And uh, Cuba has just tremendous needs. And so we're able to be a blessing. Our, our man on the ground in Cuba, is his name is Willie Santiago. And so we call our chili cook-off Chili for Willie. <laughs> and uh, because we're silly. Chili for Willie because we're silly. And so we will enjoy this, friends. We will enjoy next that is February the 10th, next Saturday, our chili cook-off. And uh, if you win, first price is 250 bucks. Second price is 100 bucks. And third price is 50 bucks. We have door prizes and we have all kinds of fun at the chili cook-off. So please come. We'll have it from about, we'll be serving from 11 to 1, but have your chili here at 10 to be judged. Friends, the following weekend, we have Leif Hetland. I call him Hetland. There's no hate in his name. It's Hetland like Shetland. Leif is tremendous. He is uh, internationally known as the top evangelist in the Muslim world or to the Muslim world. He is Norwegian. And a uh, Southern Baptist pastor growing up in Norway, answered the call, was a, a pastor to uh, an evangelical church there, a Southern Baptist church. And, uh, and his life's goal was to have 200 people on Sunday morning, which, which in Europe, that's for an evangelical church, that's a big church. And, uh, and he worked toward it and he prayed toward it and he believed toward it and he went through all kinds of things in his life. And then one day, Back in the 90s, uh, he was hit by the power of the Holy Spirit, which transformed not only his life and his ministry, but it, it has transformed the world. And he has preached and planted thousands of churches. He has preached and evangelized in over 100 countries, over 100 nations in the world. I think I'm, I'm like 10, <laughs> and, and he is tremendous. We sometimes pass each other in an airport, and, and on one occasion, I actually rode with him. Uh, we were coming out of Cuba together, and this will be his third time to come to Mississippi. Friends, I want you to come. We'll have him on Saturday. Uh, I believe that's uh, February the 17th and February the uh, 18th. Saturday and Sunday. On Saturday, it's uh, at 3 and at 6. And then on Sunday, it's at 10.30. Just a Sunday morning service here. We're going to start at 10.30. We want you to be here. It's very important. You need to hear what he has to say. And uh, he has a wonderful anointing for healing and for deliverance. You know, he's, uh, he, he just draws incredible amounts of people. Hundreds of thousands of people into soccer stadiums in Islamic countries where God has given him favor. And uh, it's, uh, it's just our privilege to, to know him. And for him to come to Mississippi is really quite a treat. I tell people, if you want to see him, you know, he was, 
in uh, a conference in Nashville I attended many, many, many years ago. And uh, there were 7,000 people there. Uh, oh, he's in a soccer stadium in Islamabad, and there's well over 100,000 people there. And so you could see him in those type places. Just go. Or you could just come to Florida, Mississippi. We'll let you sit on the front row. We have a lot of people coming from a lot of different places, and we want you to come. Uh, uh, if you're having trouble getting here, maybe you can't uh, you can't uh, afford the hotel. We'll help you with that. Maybe you can't afford gas money. Hey, we'll help you with that. We want you to come. We want you to do whatever it takes to get here. And uh, he's going to leave a deposit in you, a blessing, an impartation of, of, God's, of God's great mercy that will impact your life for the rest of your life. Amen, amen, amen. Friends, do you have your Bibles? Uh, a few Sundays ago, people began at my request to send me their their uh, favorite passages or their life verses or maybe verses that have been uh, correct, uh, a corrective to them at some point in their life or a verse that has challenged them or a church that has, I mean, a, a verse that has reminded them of, of uh, something that helped them along uh, the journey. And so we're working these in and out of, of some messages and so I want you to join. I got this one. Several people sent me this particular verse. And so I'll just read. I'm only going to read, let me see, about three or four verses. I'll, I'll decide. But look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 1. This passage I preached three or four times since I've been here, but always on Mother's Day. And as I read it, you'll understand why I preach this on Mother's Day. The Mother's Day portion of this is obvious, but I'm not going. I'm not going to preach on it today. I'm going to preach on the uh, the most compelling part of this text. This is uh, Paul speaking to Timothy in the second letter when Timothy is ready to throw in the towel. Now, uh, Timothy, Paul had ministered to Timothy, and and he had prophesied over him. He had laid hands over him, and and uh, laid hands on him. And he's careful with him because it didn't work out so well with Paul and Mark. And so he's, he's really hanging on to this one. But what I want to do is just read this. And I think you will find it incredibly and, uh, and incredibly uh, helpful. Helpful. I'm going to share with you some things that, uh, that have helped me along the way. And, uh, but let's go ahead. Look with me. Second Timothy. I'll give you just a second, 2 Timothy chapter 1. And of course, you know that we're in uh, the middle of the New Testament, actually going toward the end. If you get to over to 1st, 2nd, 3rd, John, Jude, and Revelation, you've gone too far. you got to go back the other direction. Of course, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, uh, what's next after that? Hebrews, you've got uh, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, those, those places. But... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I guess we'll just pick it up in verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 1, let's start in verse 3. Paul is writing to Timothy. He says, I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I, he says, I pray for you all the time. I pray without ceasing for you, Timothy. Verse four says, recalling your tears, Timothy is depressed. He's gotten discouraged. He's gotten afraid. And it's just not going well. Recalling your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith. Timothy, there's nothing wrong with your faith. Some preacher comes through town and says, brother, your faith's weak. There's nothing wrong with your faith. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I'm also persuaded that that sincere faith lives in you also. Look at verse six and seven. This is this is sort of where the 
rubber meets the road. If you've heard me preach this passage, I've almost always preached on Lois and Eunice. As in, it's sort of a Mother's Day. His, the, the, his spiritual formation, he could owe in no small part to his mother and to his grandmother, just like John Wesley. For this reason, I remind you to fan in the flame the gift of God or stir, stir up the gifts of God that are in you. If you read the other version of the Bible, which is in you, you receive this through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us, he didn't give me, he didn't give you, Timothy, a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. Oh my goodness, what is he teaching us here? God did not give us a spirit of fear. God did not give us a spirit of fear or uh, some versions say timidity. The, the older versions say a spirit of fear. And that's something that uh, Paul here identifies fear as a demon spirit and when Paul said I the the spirit that came on you when I laid my hands on you Mr. Timothy is not was the Holy Spirit <laughs> the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are within you it is not a demon spirit a lying spirit fear we say we we sing this fear is a liar fear is a liar some people uh, use this sort of mnemonic device for fear. They say uh, false evidence appearing real. So, so fear is fraudulent. I, I suppose that's a good one. I know that there are a lot of fears that are just based on a paranoia or the devil gets a hold of us and we just insist things aren't going, or, you know, that uh, things just aren't going to go well. Like, uh, Mark Twain spoke about this, and he said, I've worried about so many things in my life, the overwhelming majority of which never came true, never came to pass. And so that kind of fear, where just the devil gets his, his word inside your mind, he, he, he comes in and he's stealing your joy and all of that, that's, that's certainly true, but you know, not all, not all fears are just irrational. Some of them are, are grounded in, in, in reality. I mean, we, there is a war going on in the Middle East. We are involved in a war in Europe. We shouldn't be there. There are wars going on all over the place. Bad things are happening. There are sick people in the hospital and all of that. But still, still, what about fear? What about fear? Well, fear is kind of a perverted faith, isn't it? Well, we, t we tell people they need to have faith. What we really mean is we need to have faith in God. We need to have faith in the Lord. But fear is, fear is faith. It's just faith in the devil. It's just putting, it's just believing that the devil is going to do something to you or that life is going to do something to you and it's going to destroy you and that's just too bad for you. I think the, kind of the sickest way fear works. And, and I'm gonna be careful about this because you know, everybody's afraid of something. But we have to, uh, you know, we have to man up sometimes. That's, I don't mean that in a sexist way. Uh, my mother is not afraid and uh, she doesn't man up, she woman's up. But I'm talking about uh, how we become afraid of things and the devil convinces us that, that we're not afraid. I mean, people be scared to death and, and they won't admit that they're afraid. Instead, they insist that they're wise. Hey guys, we're gonna go to Israel next summer. Anybody wanna go? Yeah, we took 42 people and picked up two extra, which actually had 43. But still, some people really wanted to go, but they wouldn't. They wouldn't because they were afraid. But they don't want to say they're afraid. And so they couch it in the language of wisdom. 
I just don't think it's wise to go to Israel during this season. I'm going to wait till there's peace over there that I'm going to go. And I'm going to say, you're going to wait till you're dead? <laughs> you know, that's going to be the battle place all the way to the end. And so uh, what you're really saying is I'm just afraid to go. It's okay. It's okay. I'm not making fun of you. But, but it's not wisdom that keeps you from going. It's fear. You're just using the language of wisdom. It makes you feel better. Or, uh, I just don't think it's wise to leave the country. I don't think it's wise to go to Mexico. Let's go down to Mexico and let's, let's save the laws, heal the sick, cast out demons, feed. Let's go do it. Let's go to a communist country. Let's go to Cuba. Cuba? Oh, no, not Cuba. You remember the Cuban Missile Crisis? That lives in people. If you're my age or older, and probably older than me, you remember that the, the paranoia around that, you know, and JFK and uh, all of that, and the old Soviet Union and and Castro and and the revolution, just how horrible that time was. And people say, "No, no, no, I'm not going to." Yeah, the people down there are hungry for the Lord. Let's go share Jesus with them. Let's take them a bottle of aspirin and a and a uh, and a Bible. And people will say. Well, that just, I just don't think that's wise. And what they're really telling me is, Scott, you're a fool. See, I don't think it's wise to go. Therefore, if you're going, you're a fool. But what they're really saying is they're scared. So I'm a fool, but you're afraid of cat. But I'm not a fool. You know, people die. Sure, certainly, people die here. They die everywhere. But uh, the moment we give in to fear, you know, our faith really suffers. And, and that's just too bad. You see, it's a spiritual war out there. You're not so wise. You're not so wise. You know, people say, I wouldn't be caught dead in Mexico. Well, you don't have any trouble going to Cancun. <laughs> you don't have any trouble going to Mazalan, or however you say that, or Puerto Vallarta, or Acapulco. Well, I know, but those are resorts. Those are vacation destinations. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll risk my life for a vacation, but I'm not going to risk my life for the kingdom of God. I know. <laughs> I know how you are. I know how we are. We're all alike. I have fears. I'm going to give you some of my fears. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm afraid of spiders and snakes. Uh, I'm afraid of, uh, lightning. Boy, lightning really gets under my skin. When it starts lightning out there, I'm, I am jumpy, 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 jumpy. You know, I'm afraid to fly. I was counting up the other day. We were on an airplane a few weeks ago and I was flying home and I was, I was sick. I had a, I had a virus and I'm sitting there and uh, I decided to make a list of all the airports around the world that I've flown in and out of and all the continents I visited. And the list was getting long and I'm looking at it. And, I, and you know what, friends? I can't hardly believe that I ever got on, the, on an airplane to begin with. Because I've always had this thing about flights. And, you know, the first time I flew, I was in my 20s. And the second time I flew, I was almost 40. It's just not my thing. But... Uh, but you know, the Lord calls us to things. And, and uh, you've heard Jim Elliott say this. It's very famous. He was a missionary who died at age 27. People told him it wasn't wise to go down the Amazon and convert these uh, uh, newly found native tribes about 50, 60 years ago, 60 years ago, I guess. And, and this is what he said. He said, you're not a fool to lose what you cannot keep in order to gain what you cannot lose. He, he was kingdom-minded. And so he and his entire crew, about four men, all died, and their wives went down a year later and converted the whole, converted the whole. Now, those that are still alive are, are close to 100, but they converted the whole, all of those newly discovered tribes in the Amazon. How about that? 
And a million years from now, Jim Elliott and his friends, his, their names will still be sung in heaven for what they did for the kingdom. They weren't afraid to lose what they couldn't keep in order to gain what they couldn't lose. And so if you're afraid, you're just not that wise. I mean, I'm afraid. I, I am afraid. Just, just about, what, a week ago? I was flying home from uh, California, and the guy, the captain, comes on the the speaker, and he says that uh, he says we're going to have about two and a half hours of smooth sailing, and he said, but the last hour and a half it's going to be rough. We're hitting the backside of a front, and he said we'll do the best we can, but we're not going to serve. We we don't want you to go to the bathroom. We don't want you to do anything like that. We're going to have our flight attendant sit down, put on their seat belts, and hang on. And show sure enough, it happened. I was sitting there and I was thinking, Lord, have mercy. I don't know if I like it better knowing or not knowing. And we were boom, 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 boom. I've been in a lot of uh, turbulence in different countries. And, and, and at the equator, there's generally turbulence there every trip. But, but you know, God has called you to do things. And you know, friends, I've had nagging fears in my life and I just wasn't sure. One of my fears is that I'm sort of afraid just to be myself. And because uh, and you think that if people really get to know the real you, they might not like you. And so preachers have this thing where they just try and be, they just try and be, uh, you know, the, the, the textbook or, you know, the, the preacher out of, uh, out of a TV movie, out of a Hallmark movie, you know, you always want to be perfectly pious and and you want to sound like you're wise. You want to be able to quote not just scripture, but quote, you know, people from, uh, you know, you want to quote Immanuel Kahn or Kierkegaard and people like that. You want to throw another little Shakespeare and uh, you want to be a little bit erudite and all of that. And that just never has been my way. I am extremely well read, but but uh, I am also just wired differently than everybody else. It, it worried me for a long time. It worried me for a long time. I, uh, I went to a conference in Little Rock, and I heard this woman preach. I didn't get a chance to meet her, but she preached, I think, the opening service, maybe the first or second service there and. About 1,500 people there from all over the United States, different parts of the world. And it was an all Methodist, United Methodist Conference. And for the more conservative evangelical wing of our church, spirit-filled wing of our church, and they call it Aldersgate. And, and I just uh, I just loved listening to this woman preach. And so I asked some, I took a bunch of people. Was there a lot of people from Mississippi? And so I asked around, I said, who is this woman who's preaching? And, and a bunch of my friends had gone to her seminar, and uh, she prayed over everybody. They gave her a room, a little tiny room to hold her seminar in. She spoke in the plenary session, and then she did a breakout session the next day. And it went all day and all night, went out to the wee hours of the morning, and people just lined up to have her pray for them and speak a word over them. And People were coming to me in the hall. I was in another, I was in another area of the conference, but... Uh, and they would say, uh, boy, have you heard this woman? And I said, well, I heard her last night. They said, you got to go to her session. But her sessions were closed off. There were too many people. They gave her room for about 150 people, and she probably had eight or 900 people show up for her, for her breakout sessions. So I got home. I never got a chance to meet her. And so I called her, and I said, I want you to come to Mississippi in 2000, the year 2000, and we're going to have a conference what you call your conference? And I said, I call it Flow River Flow. I'd never had, a, I'd never held a conference. Really, I'd never held. I think I had a Ben Kinslow who came for one night and different ones. And so this African-American preacher, she was Methodist at the time, uh, uh, brilliant, the first African-American woman ever to receive a, uh, a fellowship, a PhD fellowship at Vanderbilt University in Hebrew and Old Testament languages, and I mean, she's smart, just so smart, she's erudite, but she's gifted. She just talks to you and just can read your, can read your mail. She's not a psychic, she was a prophetess, a woman prophet. 
So I said, I've got to meet this woman. So I called her up and I invited her and she said she'd come. And I said, look, I had 1800 bucks. I said, bring whoever you want to come with you. And she brought three women. So the four of them came down and I bought their airfare. And I just remembered, I probably don't even have enough money to buy their airfare. I didn't charge anything for the conference. We had about 300 people show up. The praise man from Laurel came down. Daniel Blaylock, who's now in Mobile, he came. And uh, we had a worship service. We had It was Thursday night, all day Friday, Friday night. And we ended at noon on Saturday. And people just packed it out. Just people from every walks of life. Lots and lots and lots of people. But uh, somebody went to the airport for me and picked her up and they brought her in and we took her into the sanctuary there in Biloxi where I was the pastor and sanctuary sat about 300 people and we packed it out. We had a little balcony up there for overflow. Katrina took that church down. It's not even there. It's uh, They built a, about a third of the complex there now, but it was big back in those days and and so uh, Bernadine walked in and I introduced myself and this is Pastor Bernadine, and, and uh, these are the people who will be working with us. These guys will be singing. These guys will be, you know, helping uh, host you and all of that. And she said, well, before the, this was Thursday right after lunch. And she said, before, we, we're starting the night about 6 o'clock. But before we start, I want to go ahead and minister to, uh, to you to you who will be working in the conference because you'll be so busy working in the conference that you may not have a chance uh, to get ministered to during the conference. And we said, fine, great. So she started with me and she and the, her, her friends came over and they laid hands on me. And I just remember thinking, holy cow, wow, this is about to get out of control. I mean, I could feel the Holy Spirit in her, in her, in her, in her voice, in, in her hand. She like touched me like this and went, whoa. My goodness, this woman's anointed. And, and the very first thing she said that I remember it, and it's on cassette tape, it's somewhere in this office. I'll look it up sometime for you. I think I found it in the laundry room at my house, and it's been 23 years. I still have 24 years. And I think this this month, this next month will be 24 years. And so I was just receiving, you know, and she said, uh, and she started talking about generational curses and she said in your family there's a disease and it just hits everybody and she said uh, and and all the generations they grow up wondering if they're going to be sick and she looked at me and she said you're not going to be sick and your children aren't going to be sick you do not have this I knew what she meant it's polycystic kidney disease I knew then I didn't have it a couple of times I thought I had it before then and since then, but I never have. I've been to the doctor, I've been many tests. My father, you, you remember, his twin brother, uh, two other brothers, a sister, lots of cousins, and both of my sisters have struggled with polycystic kidney disease. Bernadine told me 24 years ago this next month that I would not have polycystic kidney disease. How about that? And then she said that God has given me a gift. She said, I had an anointing for deliverance ministry. Well, that, you know, that's not an anointing that I ever wanted. The only time you really want to cast out a demon out of somebody is when, is when you have one right before you. But, you know, to be a deliverance minister, a ghostbuster, you get called to people's houses like the exorcist or something, that's, is that's a gift for somebody else. And then she taught me something that I never, I never knew. I knew that, and I'd been in the ministry for 14 years, graduated from seminary, and I've had scores of people who would say to me, either giving me a compliment or cursing me, that I was uh, too funny. I was, they said, my sense of humor was going to get me in trouble, and... Some people would say, you're only a stand-up comedian. You're not really a preacher. And they'd say stuff like that to me. I remember one lady right here in this church. She's with the Lord now. And she's kind of a stout old woman. And she went out of the church one Sunday. She, she was not the president of my fan club, but she would always elbow me because I hugged her every Sunday. <laughs> and she would elbow me in the ribs. 
but I'm like my father. You're going to speak to me. You're going to look at me. I, if you're in that building, I'm going to love on you, whether you want me to love on you or not. And she looked at me one day, and this was about 16, 17, 18 years ago. She said, I've been here a long time. She said, you're not a preacher. You're a stand-up comedian. You need to learn how to preach. I said, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And and it just blew her mind. <laughs> and Bernadine, to, 24 years ago, Bernadine looks at me and she says, God has given you an incredible sense of humor. And she says, when you preach, people laugh. They laugh along with you. She said, the people really enjoy your preaching. She had never laid eyes on me. She never heard me preach. She never heard me speak. Uh, she looked at me. I was nervous. I was clammed up because, you know, I'm, I am timid in, by my personality. I'm scared to death of public speaking. And Bernadine looks at me and she says, God has given you just an incredible sense of humor. And she said, your anointing is deliverance. And she says, when you stand up before people and you're preaching and you're bringing in all this off the wall stuff and your sermons are moving from place to place and people are laughing and they just are enjoying you so much as they laugh. She said, they are being set free. She said, don't ever let anybody take your gift away from you. Preach and pray and laugh. 24 years later, I still have that tape. My goodness, my goodness. I know, I know. Timothy, son, there's a gift in you. And the world has in intimidated you. Timothy, you're afraid. Timothy, you're not yourself. You know, you're letting your critics put you in their little box, their little view of what you ought to be. But Timothy, don't you worry about what people say you ought to be. You be you. You see, people need to be freed. The lady who elbowed me every Sunday, she wouldn't let me free her until a couple of days before she died. And she called me in and and I held her hand and she put her fingernails on my hand and she said, preacher, I need you. I need to be free. She wanted to be healed. We had prayed a lot for her to be healed. What she really needed was to be saved and to be delivered and to be freed. You know, you come into church at night, not, not everybody's this way. I'm sure she wasn't this way, but People have a kind of a hard Saturday night, you know. They stay out late or they hang out with their friends. They drink and they wake up on Sunday morning with a headache and they go to church and and people are up there singing. They're raising their hands. The preacher comes up. He's jovial and he's laughing and he's enjoying his... And they're hungover and their head hurts. I'm not going to laugh with you. They want to get out of there. They want to get out of there as close to 12 as they can. 11.45 would suit them. So just cut the stuff. Cut it all out. Say what it is you got to say and let me go home. You know, friends, that's too bad. That's too bad. Because Jesus wants you to be free. Years ago, I think in the 60s, uh, a gentleman's magazine, Hugh Hefner's magazine. I'm going to call the name. Like, Y'all know what it is. Got children here, I don't want to say. But they were sort of, uh, you know, they just really hated the Bible and they hated Christians. And they put a picture in their magazine. I was a kid. I certainly didn't see this. I've, I've seen the picture. It's pictures everywhere. And it's Jesus, and he's got his head tilted back, and he's laughing. He's having a belly laugh. It's that same picture you see of Jesus, only in this picture he's laughing. And he thinks he's blaspheming. He thinks he's making Christians mad, and he would have made some of you mad. But, uh, but by and large, he didn't make anybody mad. Because Jesus laughs. 
God sits in his throne, on his throne, and he laughs. The Bible says that time and again. We serve a God who laughs. We serve a God who has a wonderful sense of humor. And the heathen rage and imagine vain things. They plot against the Lord and his anointed. And, and the Lord sits on his throne and he laughs. Bernadine told me that that's my gift. Having never heard me preach, how did she know? How did she know? Stir up the gift that's in you. You have a gift in you. Timothy, God has given you a gift. But you let the world squash your gift. People have put demands on you that God didn't put on you, Timothy. God did not give you this spirit of fear. It came from the devil. It came from your congregation. It, you didn't get it from your mama. You didn't get it from your grandma. But you got it from somewhere, Timothy. Stir up the gift of God that's in you. Be yourself, Timothy. Timothy, you be you. You be you. You'll be all right. How about that? You have a gift. Use your gift. Use your gift. Use your spiritual gift. Use them. Express them. Be who you are. If somebody doesn't like it, somebody wants to judge you, let them. <laughs> you know, one day they'll call you. They call me. Preacher, pray for me. I'm going to die. I've been miserable all my life. Every time you laugh, I get offended. I want you to be as miserable as I am. I'm not going to be. I'm going to laugh. I want you to laugh. I want you to be free. Let me pray for you. Lord, I come to you in Jesus' name, and I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. The heathen rage and imagine vain things. They rail against the Lord and his anointed ones. And the Lord sits on his throne and he laughs. Psalm 126. God fills our mouths with laughter. We sow in tears and we reap in joy. Hallelujah. We serve a God who dances, Zephaniah tells us. We serve a God who sings, Zephaniah tells us. We serve a God who laughs, the scripture tells us again and again. Lord, I just bless those who are watching today. I hope that they are self-aware enough to see that the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness and it's peace and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. People ask me, why are you laughing? I say, why aren't you laughing? He feels our mouths with laughter, Psalm 126. He sits on his throne and laughs, Psalm 2. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who are just hurting today. It's hard to laugh when your body hurts. I know, I know. Herniated neck, disc in my neck and in my lower back. Uh, drugs, uh, muscle relaxers that leave me debilitated and my mouth is dry and I have a hard time forming sentences. It's hard to laugh. It's hard to share the joy of the Lord when your body aches. But Lord, I, uh, I walk in that. It's hard to laugh when you're sitting on an airplane 35,000 feet in the air and the thing feels like it's falling apart. But you have filled us with joy and you, you have made us to laugh. Oh, it's hard to laugh when, when the doctor comes in and gives you grim news. It's hard to laugh. It's hard to laugh when you're leaving the 
Terry, having said goodbye to the people that mean the most to you in the entire world, it's hard to laugh. But Lord, you fill our mouths with laughter. You fill our hearts with joy. Lord, we sure do love you. I wish, Lord, I wish, I, I wish, I pray, really, that every person watching this video today would experience some joy. Just baptize us afresh and anew. Baptize us, Lord, with holy laughter. And let, oh God, let, oh God, the river flow. Flow, river, flow. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You know, there is a river that flows from the house of God, doesn't it? And streams make glad the city of God. The river gives joy and it gives life. Flow, river, flow. We have a lot of conferences around here. Friends, did you know that Flow, River, Flow is coming up on its 25th anniversary, the silver anniversary of our movement? The movement started by me just because I met a, uh, I didn't meet her, I saw a woman in Little Rock, Arkansas at the convention center at the Excelsior Hotel, the famous Excel or infamous Excelsior, if you know Bill Clinton's history. And, uh, and people were so touched by her, I said, I have to meet her, and then... I chased her down to Detroit, Michigan. This brilliant, brilliant woman, Dr. Bernadine Daniels Wormley. I love her. And uh, Wormley Daniels, Bernadine Wormley Daniels. I love her and I love Joanne Moody. She did our conference last year and she's, she is our guest speaker for Flow River Flow silver anniversary that's june of 2025 that's a year and a half from now but Leif haitland will be here in just two weeks <laughs> and he'll be here just for saturday and sunday and i want you to come come spend one night i'll help you find a hotel i'll help you pay for it you just come whatever it takes for you to come i want you to come god has a wonderful plan for you. Life Haitland conferences, the registration is about 150 bucks to go to one of the Voice of the Apostles conferences. 150 bucks. Your conference fee has already been paid. We pay for it here. You just have to come. Your way, your fees have all, your registration, everything has been paid. You come, you walk through there. You walk through the door. You don't have to do a thing. I don't need your credit card. I don't need your a check. I don't need anything. I just need you to come through the door. You come and receive. Spend Saturday and Sunday basking in the glory of God's love. Leif Haitland is the most prominent evangelist in the Muslim world today. Any denomination, any continent. It's Leif Haitland. Having Leif Haitland in your church in 2024 is like having Billy Graham come to your church in the year 1970. It's amazing. I want you to be here. Don't forget, one week, next weekend on Saturday, this coming weekend on Saturday, uh, we're having uh, our chili cook-off. That's February the 10th. Then February 17th and 18th, the following weekend, it's Leif Haitland. That's both of those events in the next two weeks. I look forward to seeing you here. Look, it's February. It's the, it is the uh, month where we celebrate love, Valentine's Day. I'll have you something in the mail. I love you. I'll see you soon. Bye, everybody. How long do you think that went?